welcome to Cambridge University Botanic Garden. My name's Sandy Kane and we're in the school's garden today for Ask the Gardener, which is your opportunity to ask us any questions that you have about growing, um, any issues that have come up in your garden that we can help with. It's a beautiful day. We've been waiting for the sunshine and um, yeah, here we are with sunshine for the next few days, which is really, really, really welcome. We're, um, so I'm at this side of the camera, but holding the camera is Helen. Helen's um, gonna be asking me the questions that you put in the um, text box today. So if you've got any questions, please do write them in the box there so that I'm able to answer them for you. Um, I'm gonna focus today on pests and diseases um, because um, it's that time of year, we need to start thinking about them. Um, so uh, the other thing that we're going to look at today is good garden maintenance. What a difference maintaining your garden at this time of year when it just turns into a jungle um, can make to the quality of your plants and your growing. Um, and uh, yeah, what else you can sow at this time of year. So what are the jobs in the garden at this time of year? So what so, are we going to start with, Sandy? Okay, so we're talking about pests and diseases. The best way to prevent problems in your garden as regards pests and diseases is to uh, stop them before they start. And with something like potatoes, which we've got here, um, you can choose just to grow early potatoes um, because the worst sort of pest or problem that you can have for potatoes is blight. It is a blight time of year um, and um, blight um, is usually worse on main crop potatoes. The later in the season the more likely you are to get blight on them. Um, blight happens when you have temperatures of over 11 degrees at night and 90% humidity so with the but and that's for three nights in a row and we that has been what we've had lately so we've had it really really damp but the temperatures overnight have been quite warm. So now's the time when blight might be an issue. It might be an issue on your potatoes. It might be an issue on your tomatoes. So the first thing you can do is choose resistant varieties and that negates the problem altogether. Um, the second thing that you could do for blight is to keep an eye on your crops. So what you're looking for is um, spots of um, mold looking, uh, brown patches, black patches um, on your leaves and on your stems um, that look mouldy um, and it quickly moves through so you need to really keep an eye on that. If you do think you've got blight just check, 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 Re have a look on the internet, check against pictures to see what it is that you've got and if you have you can just take the tops off and then you can leave your potatoes underground for a week or two and then lift them um, what do you do? So you just put it on the compost bin no, or do you no, burn them? No, absolutely not. Just get rid of it, put it in the regular waste bin or burn it um, because it's like spores in the air. So you don't want that in your compost and you don't want it flying around in the air. So yeah, that's one of the main issues at the moment, might be blight. We've also got our brassica bed here. Um, so you'll see on the brassica bed we've started harvesting, so we've been harvesting our coal rabbi, I'll just pull this one because it's pretty ready. Look at that, they're so cool. <laughs> um, they look like little spaceships, so we don't eat them a lot here in the UK, but actually they're fantastic. It's a cross between a radish um, and a brassica, so it's slightly radishy texture, but tastes more brassica-y. Um, so you can peel that and grate it in, um, in a coleslaw, um, or you can, um, cut it into little bits and put it in soups or stews. Stir fries, so, they're very good in stir, stir fries. fries. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it just looks really cool. Kids really like it because it looks like a spaceship. But um, you'll see my brassicas are pest free and that is mainly because we made a barrier. So just the second step of protecting your crops from pests and diseases is to make a barrier that protects them. So first, choose resistant varieties. Secondly, make a barrier to stop butterflies, pigeons, terrible for pigeons here, um, 
yeah that old, that lovely micro mesh and it lasts for years actually will stop any sort of flying insects caterpillars and uh, birds from damaging your brassicas um, uh, it even works on flea beetle but you have to get it from the beginning I've got a bit of tractor action outside the school's garden so sorry if that's a bit noisy okay so the next thing we've got this is a barrier to protect from um, deer muntjacs um, and this is my beetroot and spinach bed um, it's got a little bit weedy because I was away on holiday so I'm just going to show you although these are no dig beds there are some weeds that have really good roots and you need to get those out otherwise it will just grow straight back now this is perfect weather for hoeing and if you've got a bed full of annual weeds this is the time to get hoeing um, basically once you hoe off the top of your bed from annual weeds because it's so dry they're just going to expire on the top and they'll be gone by the next day so if you haven't been hoeing because of the weather uh, because it's been too wet get hoeing this weekend um, the thing about weeds is not only do they steal the nutrients and the light and the food from the soil, from the plants that you're growing, but they also harbour pests and diseases. So aphids, uh, flying insects, slugs and snails, uh, they'll hide under the, um, under the weeds. Whereas if you've got a nice clear bed, the slugs and the snails won't go across it and they'll um and if they do hopefully the birds will get them before they get to your crops so yeah definitely we keep weed free as much as you can it doesn't take long and um it will make such a difference to the growing of your vegetables um and it will ensure that uh they remain pest free so i'm gonna sow along here some more beetroot and some rainbow chard which I'm quite excited about so we've got beetroot over here spinach we're gonna have more beetroot perhaps golden ones and then we're gonna have some chard and will you direct sow those Sandy yeah or? yeah it's a perfect time you know I might wait until after this hot few days have passed um, and then I'll get straight down and, and sow direct um, that you haven't got the same problems with uh, um, the temperatures and stuff. Although things like lettuces, they don't like hot temperatures, they prefer it a bit cool. And but what just... about direct sowing? So um, I've direct sown some pak choy and um, it's been eaten and my kale. So okay. do, do people need to be protecting new crops that they sow? So if it's slugs and snails that are eating your pak choy, um, which is likely, you can put like a little, so sometimes I'll chop the bottom off a two litre bottle of, of pop and then I'll put that over as like a mini cloche, so that's a really nice way of doing it. Um, slugs and snails, I collect, so in the evening I'll pop round with a little torch and a bucket and I'll collect them up, um, especially if it's a damp evening because they'll all be out, um, that's a really good way. When I used to work on the farm, we used to roll the soil with a, a roller and it would crush the snail eggs. You can use um, um, biocontrols, so nematodes are really good for slugs, not so much snails, and you water them into the ground and it's really cheap. It sounds really fancy actually. So we said your first port of call for stopping uh, problems in the garden was to choose varieties that are not susceptible. Your second port of call is a barrier or cultural control, so weeding, watering well, feeding. You could still give your soil uh, a good feed at this time of year uh, for a last sort of spurt of growth, but then you'd move on to biological controls. Now people often think, oh, biocontrol is just something that you have in the greenhouse. Well, actually, nematodes are really useful in the soil. You can use uh, biocontrols for ants. Um, some people have problems with ants. Um, vine weevil, 
the uh, usually you, you do a drench in spring and then in autumn um, yeah have a look at the biocontrols because they're cheap and they're reasonably easy and they're kindly to your environment because they only kill the thing that you want to kill um, so while we're here in the um, beach and bed I just wanted to show you so I grow my beetroot in little groups of three and some of them are ready oh look at that isn't that nice that to me is a perfect beetroot so about the size of a golf ball sometimes you can grow them a little bit bigger like the size of a small apple but it wouldn't grow much bigger than that and how long has it taken them to get to this stage mm, so the, the labels there but I think I sowed those uh, at the beginning of April so April May June July three months um, yeah so cute um, keep on top of harvesting because as you're harvesting you're thinning out the leaves um, and you're making space in your beds um, space uh, in the soil for the other beetroots to grow but space in the leaves for the air to get round and it, that makes a difference to pests and diseases. The other thing is, sometimes people forget to pick their veg and they wait until it's really, really big, but actually it's often better when it's not super big. It's better when it's like a reasonable size. So we'll look at the courgettes in a sec. But again, you don't want them to get super massive. You don't want marrows. There we go. Nice. Look at those. <laughs> okay. So, I'll just come round to me. Oh, I'll just show you this. This is a trombuccino. Um, this trombuccino um, went in a bit before these two trombuccinos, this one. So this one, I put it in the ground about three weeks ago, but it's got a little pot next to it. And this one didn't have a pot next to it. And the difference in the size that it's grown is pretty impressive. So I put a pot into that one this morning because I was like, oh, nothing's happening. The water's just running off. Um, but this one did have one. So it just shows you what a difference the watering can make and also feeding. So I'm going to go back down here where you are. Um, these are my broad beans. The broad beans are nearly done now. Um, they're going to come out and I'm going to put some more, um, another squash in there but I've also got some lettuce that I've sown. Now is a great time to do your sort of second spring of sowing. So there's loads and loads of things that you could sow right now. Um, lettuces, pak choy, peas, beetroot, carrots, spinach, chard. Don't be afraid to get a whole new load of things in your garden. Sow some new things now because through the autumn uh, and into winter, you'll have a whole second season of cropping. Um, and you'll suddenly think, oh, there's spaces. Where my garden was full, there's spaces. So have a look what you've got in your um, seed box and have a think about what you want to sow again. Just wanted to show you one disease problem that I've got in the garden already. Um, these are gourds and uh, this is powdery mildew. Um, so powdery mildew is really something that you will often get towards the end of the season in um, in uh, cucumber family plants. Um, to me that indicates that it's probably been a bit stressed, it might have got a bit dry. It's also possible that it's got powdery mildew from the other weeds that have been in the garden because they'll really hold on to things like that. So what I'll do is I'll snip those off, those uh, affected leaves and um, I'll make sure that that's getting a regular water and a regular feed. 
Um, Some of these leaves can look quite yellow as well, Sandy. What, what's that a sign of? So yellowing leaves is often a sign of um, a lack of nutrients. I say often because sometimes it not, it's not. Sometimes it's a sign of virus or sickness. But often it's just a sign of um, that maybe it's coming to the end of its life or for some reason it's low in nutrients. So have a look at yellowing leaves. So for example, on the broad beans, um, they're starting to look a bit yellow, but that's because they're coming to the end of their life. So they're gonna come out soon. Um, yeah, and that's why they're starting to look a bit yellow. So over here, this courgette has strange yellow leaves. And I was like, oh, what is that? Is that a virus? Because you do get a sort of mosaic virus um, on um, um, cucumber family plants. But I feel reassured actually that that isn't virus. And that is just something that happens on some yellow fruited varieties. So that's a yellow courgette. See that? We've had a couple off there already. Um, so I'm not, if I felt, if I looked at that and felt that that was definitely virus, then I would take it out because what happens is a green fly and other flying insects become a vector for um, uh, viruses. So they'll feed with their um, spiky proboscis or spiky mouth parts into uh, one plant that's got virus and then when they go to the next plant, they'll take the virus there. So it's something to keep an eye on, um, but the more you, Sort of look at things and uh, look on the internet and look in books the more you'll get used to what those things look like those problems look like so just show you our beans our lovely beans you've got a really nice example there of how putting structures in the garden helps plants to grow successfully um, it's obvious with beans but lots of things like the trombocinos and the gourds they really like to climb as well melons they're another thing that likes to climb. Um, what I need to do here is to take the top growth out. I need to get a ladder and cut them off at the top. And what that will do is it'll encourage side shoots in the lower parts. So if I don't do it, I'll get loads of beans at the top of the <laughs> there that I can't reach. Um, so I'll, what I'll do is um, I'll cut the top of those beans. The side shoots will get bushier and I'll get more beans further down. Oh, look at the be action on that it's so lovely um, so I try to keep a lot of um, flowers um, going this bed is edible flowers everything here is edible and sometimes when we get schools in or community groups we eat some of those edible flowers but they're really great for pollinators Speaking of flowers, Sandy, we had a question earlier from someone um, who emailed in about flowers on rhubarb. What do you do with the flower spike and how long can you harvest your rhubarb for? Okay, so I would stop now harvesting rhubarb um, just so that it can um, take nutrients from the soil and from the light and um, so that um, that gives it enough energy for growing next year. But as you can see here, this rhubarb has flowers. Um, normally, I would take the flower spike out, but this actual what, this actual plant, it flowers every year, and um, I think it, it's not particularly happy here. Um, so I've let it flower this year, and what we've done is we've collected some of the seeds from it, and we've tried to sow them with some of the school groups. Um, so I, what I would say to you is, if you're rhubarb doesn't normally flower but it's flowered this year cut the spike off um, over winter make sure that you give it lots of um, mulch around the um, sides so that it's had a good feed um, and hopefully it won't flower next year because um, obviously when it gives its energy into making the flowers it takes it away from making the fruit so yeah there's you for rhubarb So, um, harvesting is really an art in the garden, a uh, vegetable garden. It's easy to forget that um, the reason why you're growing is so that you're going to 
eat beautiful food and sometimes people try to grow the biggest courgette or the biggest broad bean or the biggest rabbi and actually they're not always the tastiest so it's worth um, thinking about the size of the things that you buy in the shops um, and trying to sort of grow them to that size because um, that will ensure that the plant keeps on producing so with beans and courgettes for example if you let the uh, beans dry on the plant then they're gonna, um, the plant will think it's done its job, so it will stop them producing. Um, and it's the same for courgettes. If you let um, a courgette grow to this big and have massive marrows, that plant's gonna think, oh, I've set my seed. Um, I don't need to do any more work, and so you'll get less fruit. So the more you pick with a lot of these crops, the more you're gonna have um, more and more fruit. So these are things that you've grown that have come all from the school's garden this yeah, season? Yeah, yeah. So we've had a few more school groups in this year, which has been really fantastic. Um, and they've actually planted a lot of the things and they've harvested a lot of the vegetables. And we also are part of um, um, a project this year called Grow a Row, which is by Cambridge Sustainable Foods. And they're asking schools and community groups to grow an extra row of vegetables and then take them to their centres so that they can be shared with people who perhaps haven't got enough food uh, and food banks. So that's where the, this vegetables will go. So yeah, it feels like we're getting back to um, pre-COVID times that we can include children in the growing and the, of the produce and the picking and harvesting. And yeah, it's been really great. Um, and what have we got in the polytunnel? Okay, so yeah. A little bit of uh, care in protected environments. So um, one of the biggest things to do in your polytunnel or greenhouse is damp down, which means wetting the floors and surfaces. Um, that will mean that the uh, water sort of evaporates into the air, making the air not as dry as it might be. So that will benefit the plants because they're um, happier in a sort of slight like it can get really super dry in uh, these protected environments I just wanted to show you the cucumbers aren't they lovely <laughs> I'm quite excited about the cucumbers so um, the cucumbers and aubergines actually um, have a tendency to um, get something called spider mites which you can't actually see but can really affect the forming of the fruits the fruits tend to drop off um, when you've got spider mites and the leaves go all silvery. Um, but what I do is in the morning I uh, water the pots and I just water on the leaves and along here I water on the surfaces um, and uh, on the floor, wooden floor, I water on the uh, wooden floor to raise the sort of humidity in the morning but by the evening that you don't want it to be super humid, you want that to have dried out a bit. So, watering is like a big crucial thing. And presumably with the tomatoes you're still getting rid of all the side shoots. Shall we just have a quick look at... Yeah, so the anything? tomatoes have got a bit over watered. Let's peel that because these are nice. Um, but you can see here the leaves, that's a magnesium deficiency. So they have got a bit over watered these tomatoes. The kids really like watering um, and so I've been feeding them once a week to try and recover them a bit and I've also been using um, so I've been using seaweed extract which is an organic um, um, way to feed uh, so I put that in a watering can and I do that once a week but I also use this which is SB plant invigorator which is a organic spray which is a foliar feed um, but it also is um, a natural pesticide and mildewicide if that's a real word um, so it's a really it encourages growth um, straight direct through the leaves but it only kills the bad guys so when you're in a garden you're looking to try and make um, its own little ecosystem so you don't want to be using loads of bad chemicals especially when it's food that you're eating so I'd really recommend thinking about using if you're going to resort to chemicals use kindly ones that 
only sort of affect the bad guys, as it were. Okay, fantastic. So I think we haven't really got many questions that have come in on Facebook. Um, I'll just see if we've had any others. So we've talked about um, eating, protecting kale, pak choy. Um, do you just want to do a roundup on what people can say now between now and when we're next going to come live in the autumn? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm sowing at the moment lettuce, um, direct I'm sowing uh, carrots, um, beetroot and chard. Um, indoors, so I'm starting off in cells, pak choy, uh, peas, peas you can do inside or outside. Um, there's a lot of really nice um, greens, like oriental greens that um, could be sown right now, um, which are really, really delicious. But don't forget, you can also sow things like runner beans still and French beans. You could do a second sowing of those. They're really nice. Um, but go mad. Just sow what you've got in your container and see what happens because there's so much time um, to um, still grow things. and. You know, we've had a slow start to this season, so I wouldn't be surprised if we have one of those lovely Indian summers where the temperatures just stay warm um, right into October. So, happy gardening everybody, thanks for joining me.